We'll call to order the June 21st, 2018 meeting of the Radnor Township Zoning Hearing Board. Uh, invite you all to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have three items on the agenda, but we do know that one of the items uh, will have a, we, we've received notice of a request for continuance. So we're gonna cover that um, circumstance initially, get it out of the way, and then go back and handle things in order. So the first item I'm going to address is item five on the agenda. And I'll read <clears throat> the application. Appeal, 30, appeal number 3017, the applicant, Crottonville Holdings LLC, property located at 1024 East Lancaster Avenue and zoned R5 residential, seeks to convert approximately 450 square feet of an existing 3,370 square foot office building to retail use for medical dispensary. Applicant seeks a variance from section 280-34 of the zoning code for the retail use, a special exception from section 280-101A1 of the code to convert one non-conforming use to another non-conforming use or a modification of the conditions imposed by a prior decision of the zoning hearing board. Additionally, applicant seeks a variance from section 280-130B and or 280-4 of the code regarding number and size of parking spaces contends that the parking is an existing nonconformity or that's permitted by right. And the alternative applicant requests such other relief as may re be required consistent with this application, the exhibits and the testimony presented at the hearing. Council? Uh, evening, Nick Cunelia. Um, I represent the applicant on this matter. I had filed on June 20th um, a request for a continuance. Um, and in that request, I also mentioned that we will agree uh, to extend the time when the zoning board is required to hear the matter as well as issue a decision on the matter after that hearing. Um, the reason for the request was to meet with um, uh, some uh, uh, people who appeared to have some concerns about and present more information to them uh, regarding the operation of the facility itself. Okay. Council, there's, there's two issues related um, to the, the matter I wanted to call your attention. One is um, we're being continued to the July, you're continuing to the July um, hearing. Um, I wanted to remind you that we don't have an August hearing and I'm unlikely to be um, sympathetic to a request for a special meeting in August. Yes. So if your client isn't before us in July, they should keep in mind they will then be dealing with the third week of September. Yes. Second point is I wanted to remind you, I'm certainly you're aware of the um, deadline for brief submission on this matter. I know this could be um, perhaps contentious or have some interesting issues of law. If you're going to submit anything in writing in advance of our July 19th hearing, that's required two weeks in advance, and unfortunately for you, that's Thursday, July 5th. So if you're going to make any written submissions for consideration by the board and its council in connection with the July hearing, um, make sure they're in by July 5th. I understand. Okay. That being said, we're granting the continuance for uh, 1024 East Lancaster Avenue. That's the medical dispensary application, and that will be heard at the hearing on July 19th. Thank, Thank you. you. We're now going to move back on the agenda. And again, uh, if folks joined us, if there's any confusion, number three, the medical dispensary has been continued and will be heard in July. Um, now we will uh, go back uh, to 107 South Spring Mill Road. Uh, this is appeal number 3015, the applicant Sarah Chang, property located at 107 South Spring Mill Road and zoned R2 residential seeks a variance from section 280-109 of the code to replace her existing six foot fence with an eight foot fence. Counselor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, good evening to members of the board. Uh, I'm Fred Fromhold, uh, attorney and represent the applicant. Fred, I spoke too quickly. Uh, Mr. Homick has advised me that um, 
he has a matter which warrants his recusal on this. I'm sorry, Matt. I got rolling. I kept going. And is going to remove, the, the record should show he's removing himself from the room and is recused on this matter. Uh, we're happy that we have an alternate, one of our alternates here with us, and Mr. Simon will sit on this, and we have a board of five. Sorry for the interruption. Good. No, th th thank you very much. Uh, as uh, the uh, chairman has noted, uh, this is an application that involves the property at 107 South Spring Mill Road. It is uh, located in the R2 uh, Residence District. It, it comprises uh, a little over 40,000 square feet lot area, which is a little over nine tenths of an acre in land. And uh, the issue that is uh, before the board is a request for a variance to increase uh, the fence height uh, for a fence that is in the backyard of the property from the rear of the house to the, uh, uh, the rear yard uh, property line and to increase that from six feet in height to uh, eight feet in height. Uh, I have uh, uh, packages of exhibits that I would like to hand to each of the members of the board and I think that will expedite our presentation. Please do, thank you. There is an index on the uh, front of that packet. There are nine exhibits, and I'll just review them uh, with you briefly so that you'll know what it is that we will be uh, presenting to you this evening. Uh, the first exhibit is a, a site plan, A1. Uh, that is uh, also shown on the screens on either side of you. It depicts the uh, property. Uh, you'll see from other exhibits that the property doesn't have street frontage. It has uh, driveway access from Spring Mill Road. Uh, the uh, north arrow, if you will, uh, is towards the top. So this is oriented north, south, east, west. You'll see that the property is improved with a uh, single family uh, two-story dwelling with a swimming pool, a driveway that accesses it. And I've highlighted in uh, uh, orange, it. Uh, comes out a little yellowy orange, but I've highlighted in uh, orange the existing fence that is in question. Uh, you'll see from notes on the plan that the fence that extends from the corners of the house is an estate type fence. It's black uh, estate fencing. You'll see a photograph of it. Uh, and then when it gets to the rear and side property lines, it uh, transforms into a wooden fence. And uh, it is uh, uh, noted as six feet on the plan. Uh, there may be some areas that are slightly less than uh, six feet, but uh, uh, the plan does note all the fencing at six feet. You see the uh, swimming pool area in the back. Uh, the next exhibit <coughs> is uh, exhibit A2 that shows the, uh, the context of this property in the neighborhood. And uh, there is a lot of uh, vegetation and this is going to come into play because uh, the reason for this fence, you'll hear testimony from uh, the owner, uh, is uh, concerned with coyotes that have uh, uh, entered the rear yard area, which is the existing fence in, fenced in area by jumping over uh, the existing uh, fence. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> next exhibit uh, is a packet of exhibits, uh, A3, and there are a series of photographs. And uh, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner of A3, in each photograph, I've got them uh, labeled as one, two, three, and four, and uh, they correspond to exhibit A1. So if you look at exhibit A1, you will see uh, that uh, the arrows one, two, three, and four uh, show where those photographs were taken from and the direction in which uh, you're looking at each of the photographs. So in, in A3-1, uh, you can see the existing uh, estate fencing that extends from the uh, westerly side of the house towards the uh, uh, westerly property line. Uh, if you look at exhibit uh, A32, you'll see uh, a little bit uh, along the property line where uh, it, it uh, transforms from being an estate type fence into a solid 
uh, wood fence, well, with uh, slight gaps uh, in between. That's that yard. And uh, A3 shows another uh, view of the uh, fence, which is the wood fence. And uh, A34 uh, shows the, uh, uh, where there is a joinder of the estate fence that extends off the eastern side of the uh, house towards the, uh, the rear property line. So that's what uh, you see in those photographs. And you'll notice in all those photographs, there is heavy vegetation around the entire uh, uh, rear of the, uh, of the home. And uh, indeed, that, that is the condition around the entire uh, rear. Uh, it's uh, heavily green with mature, deciduous, and evergreen plantings. Uh, the next exhibit is A4. A4 is a letter that uh, uh, the owner, Sarah Chang, had written to uh, uh, the Zoning Hearing Board with respect to the fence, and uh, it, it explains the reason why she wants this fence and the concern uh, that she has uh, with regard to the safety of uh, her dog based on experiences that she's had uh, on a couple of occasions. Uh, uh, with coyotes actually getting into her rear yard, and she will tell you about that a little bit more. A5 uh, is a letter, it was part of the application package, which is uh, from a friend of uh, Sarah's who uh, had been at the home when one of these uh, events occurred. A6 is uh, an exhibit that uh, shows uh, uh, that the mainline media news back in July of 2017 uh, indicated that uh, there uh, were sightings. If you look on the second page there, it said over the weekend, Lower Varian police posted on their Facebook uh, uh, warnings to people about the sightings and that uh, the most recent sighting had been in the Villanova section. There was another sighting in uh, February of 2017 in Wynwood. And, Sarah will tell you about additional sightings that have occurred um, in the vicinity of her property. A7 is uh, a, an exhibit that uh, we think supports the request here that the fence height be elevated from six feet to eight feet. And this is from the Humane Society and it's a template uh, for coyote management and coexistence uh, plan. And uh, if you turn uh, back on that exhibit, uh, you will see in the very last uh, page uh, there that they're uh, on uh, D where it notes that dogs are vulnerable to coyote uh, confrontations and it says uh, in D3 fences can be used to keep coyotes out of residential yards but they must be coyote proof. Coyote proof fences are at least eight feet tall and made of material that coyotes cannot climb or at least six feet tall with protective device on top, uh, such as a coyote roller and so forth. Uh, and Sarah will tell you about uh, uh, her investigation there. Uh, exhibit A8 is a, a package of exhibits, and it has a, a little bit of a plan that goes with it. Uh, she's uh, obtained letters uh, from her uh, adjoining neighbors who are indicated uh, there, and you have uh, the letter of support from each of those neighbors uh, for this application. You'll note that there is one adjoining neighbor uh, immediately to the southwest uh, whose uh, property does also abut, uh, whose name is not filled in, doesn't have a letter, but you'll hear from Sarah that she had sp spoken with that neighbor uh, who has no objection to, to this application. So those are uh, the, uh, the exhibits uh, with one left, A9. And A9 happens to be Chewy, which is uh, uh, Sarah's dog, and I thought it was appropriate to add that as an exhibit. Uh, 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 forgive me for playing on your sympathy uh, uh, for that. But, part, pardon me? I'm sorry? Uh, we, we, we can have Chewy here in about 10 minutes. So. But uh, that, that is uh, the, the pet that uh, Sarah uh, has concern for and uh, desires to uh, uh, provide that additional protection. And uh, when I conclude the testimony, I'd like to make a little bit of a, a legal argument, which will be very brief, uh, as to why I believe it would be appropriate for the board to, to grant me. So with that, Sarah, if you would come up, please. Yes, I do. 
Sarah Chang. Thank Sorry. Yeah, sure. Sarah Chang. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, you're the owner of the property at 107 South Springville Road? Yes, I am. Okay, and I believe that the application included a deed to the property so that uh, as a demonstration of standing. And uh, we are here requesting a variance from the height requirements uh, as it relates to fences in Renner Township. And the section that is uh, at uh, issue in this application is section 280-109, which uh, establishes a maximum fence height of uh, six feet and you seek approval for a fence uh, as shown in the to the rear of your home that would be eight feet in height is that correct yes correct okay. and have you discussed this application with your neighbors uh, uh, you know for the for this variance yes i have okay. i've discussed it with all of my surrounding neighbors and uh, I will ask you to uh, authenticate uh, the letters in, in the exhibit uh, later. Uh, and with regard to uh, uh, this application, uh, can you uh, describe to the board the reasons why you seek this variance? So I have a small dog who I love more than anything. Um, and I also have, I don't have children, but I do have a lot of cousins who live around the area and they come to my home a lot because I'm the only one with a pool. And something happened last summer that terrified me and I can't um, invite my family members and in, in good faith and I, it makes me very scared for my dog as well. Uh, one of my friends came to visit me with her two little dogs. This was back in July of 2017. Um, and while we were in my backyard, we watched Icody jump clearly over my fence, kill one of her dogs instantly, um, and then I grabbed the other dog by the throat, and while we screamed at it, it let go and it jumped back over the fence, and we ran to the vet, to the emergency vet with the second dog, and it unfortunately died on the way. So after seeing that, um, I was incredibly shaken, and I called the township to report a coyote sighting and um, excuse me this um, the the very kind gentleman that I spoke with suggested that um, well he told me that there were definitely coyotes in the area and that I could rent a cage for about two hundred sixty five dollars for two weeks to catch the coyote and if it did catch a coyote then I should call the township back and they would come and release it in the in the woods that I shouldn't try to remove it myself um, so when I heard that I said it might come back it doesn't really solve the problem what should I do and this very very kind gentleman suggested why don't you apply for a variance and ask for a higher fence it might help so that's where I got the idea um, have you had any other incidents uh, other than that one incident yes. with the coyote coming into your yard yes yeah, so back in March of this year um, it was still cold so my pool was covered um, and I, I didn't see the coyote jump over that time, but I was looking out the kitchen sliding doors and I saw the coyote in my garden and my pool area. So I slid open the door and I yelled at it. And I think I startled it because it backtracked and it, it tore a big rip onto my tour into my pool cover because it's a soft cover. Um, so I had to get the cover replaced, and then I watched it as it ran off and then jumped over the fence. So I, I knew which way it was at least getting out and getting in. Um, and at the time of that incident, were your gates closed? Yes, all the gates were closed, and I, I watched it jump over the fence, so, which, which was a six-foot fence. Yeah. Are you aware of any other uh, coyote sightings uh, in your neighborhood? So, uh, I've actually seen another sighting, but that was in my front driveway. Um, and it was also broad daylight. Um, and after I saw the coyote, it was in between my driveway and Mrs. Wilson's. She's right behind me. She's one of my neighbors. It was between our two driveways. So as soon as I saw it, I honked my car. I was driving. I honked my car, uh, the horn, quite obnoxiously at it. And it did scurry away. And I actually let Mrs. Wilson know, do you know we have coyotes? Because she also has two dogs. And she said, yes, I've seen them too. So um, it, it's, there have been multiple sightings. And I have marked uh, Exhibit A for a letter dated May 8, 2018 to the Zoning Board and uh, that mm -hmm. bears your signature? Yes, and you that wrote does. That letter. Yes, I did. I've marked as A5 a uh, 
a letter uh, dated May 1, 2018. And is this a letter that uh, your friend, my uh, friend who wrote had that. owned those two dogs, yes. Uh, wrote? Yes. Okay. And uh, she relates the incidents of that day and yes. the uh, emotional upsetment that yes. occurred. Yes. Uh, now, uh, I had marked as a six uh, a, an article from uh, July 18, 2017, uh, Mainline Media News, uh, which noted the sightings in the Villanova section. That's an article that you had uh, provided me. Yes, right? yes. And uh, with respect to A7, uh, a template for coyote management, uh, you had provided me that document as well? Yes, that's from the Humane Society of the United States. It states that um, for the safety of pets and children that they recommend a fence of eight feet or higher. Now, can you tell us what investigation you made into uh, the type of protection or fencing that would be adequate to keep uh, coyotes out of your yard? So after the first incident, I was incredibly shaken, so I started doing um, an enormous amount of research online, um, looked up everything that I could about fence height, how to keep pets and small children safe. Um, I came across the this article uh, written by the Humane Society of the U.S., um, which gave me a little bit of comfort um, thinking that an eight-foot fence might help. I have also called and spoken with um, several coyote roller companies. These are companies um, that I, I spoke with, one in California, one in Arizona, and one in Colorado. Now, they specialize in attaching rollers on top of your existing fence. So the idea, I'm guessing, is that it would sort of slip off as it's trying to jump over the fence. Um, now, every single one of those companies told me um, that they would recommend that the fence be eight feet or higher. I have a letter here, or a copy of an email, rather, from one of those companies confirming that. Um, and on, on top of that, um, it's just, just endless hours of internet research. And have you spoken with other people to confirm uh, in your mind that the uh, appropriate height for this fence uh, is eight feet? They all seem to think eight, eight feet or higher would be the appropriate amount. I have spoken to a few local fencing companies, um, and surprisingly, their answer has been, oh, we have coyotes? They, a lot of them don't seem to know. And those who have heard that there might be predators out there um, don't seem to really specialize in the rollers, which was why I had to look towards the West Coast, because it seems to be a bigger problem over there. Now, I had not included in the exhibit packages I handed out an A9. But I'm going to ask uh, Sarah uh, to uh, uh, tell us what A9 is. Uh, it appears to be an email exchange. Yes, and it is from. Let, let me hand oh, uh, sure. this in first. Oh, okay. to each of the board members. Thank you. This is from a representative from one of the Coyote Roller Companies. And this was in response to an email that I had sent her um, asking about fence height. And she says she recommends, their company recommends a fence of eight feet or higher. And then she goes on to warn me that please be aware that coyotes not only jump over fences, but can also dig under. So you would need at least 12 to 18 inches of fencing underneath the ground on top of the eight feet or higher above the ground. So it is your intention to have a, an estate fence that would extend uh, eight feet above grade. Yes. And meet the eight foot, uh, and meet a eight, eight foot height requirement in the same way a six foot fence would be required to meet a six foot height requirement. Correct, yes. And, and a foot of this fence would be uh, buried, so you would need effectively a nine foot high fence to yes. get a foot of it underground and eight feet up above ground. Correct, that, that's, had, that's what I took from this email, right. yes. And it is your intention that the uh, fence would be uh, chain link, or I'm sorry, would be <laughs> uh, estate type fencing rather than a, a wood fence or a chain link fence? Yes. 
and uh, it would look something on the order of the fencing that is shown on A31. Yes, I, I already have an estate type fencing and I think that's just aesthetically, it looks a little more elegant. So if I were gonna go, if I would be allowed to go higher, then I, I think I would probably prefer the estate type. But I, I'm honestly not too hung up on what the material is, more so the, the height required to, to protect my dogs and the small kids that come to visit. Yes. Uh, normally, we have a little bit of you know trouble with the accepting emails, uh, usually in in terms of somebody trying to get party status. But you you can testify that this yes. email came from uh, a West Coast company, and that this yes. email uh, it was Coyote Rollers, yes. and that th this email was what you received, and that you yes. didn't she, that uh, this uh, Trisha uh, Whiteley yes. did not uh, give you any contrary advice. But this is but but what she said in this email. Yes, correct. Thank you. I had uh, described uh, a series of photographs uh, that were uh, uh, marked as A3. Uh, this depicts uh, mature vegetation. As you stand at the rear of your home and look across the pool from left to right in all of the areas that would be uh, covered, if you will, by this fence, is there uh, mature vegetation uh, in a manner that appears uh, in, in each of these photographs. Yes, it is covered <laughs> with trees and bushes and greenery, yes. Uh, so that uh, do you have uh, a, a view, an opinion, uh, as an owner of the property, whether this fence uh, material of a, a black estate uh, fence would be less offensive, less uh, obtrusive, less visible uh, to adjoining properties than a solid wood fence would do. I think it just looks more elegant, but um, part of why I am hoping to be able to replace this with, with an all iron or all aluminum fence is also because one of my neighbors, um, uh, Mrs. Murdoch, Joan Murdoch, has requested um, if I go higher than to get rid of the wood, the wood fencing that I have and to go estate. I'm speaking to Mrs. Uh, Mr. Mr. Frommold, uh, it looks to me like we have two A9s. So rather than have Chewy, or I'm sorry, that, that should be A10. I, I, I don't want. Yeah, to, let's get. Let, I, I don't want to demote Chewy. Yeah, let's let's so, let's let, let's let, let Chewy have his own exhibit. Thanks. I'm sorry, Mr. Frommold. I appreciate you picking that up. Uh, so we can mark that A10. Um, so look, look, looking at A8, uh, these are letters that you. Uh, uh, had obtained from each of those neighbors. Yes. And those neighbors' names are shown on the map that is attached to A8 and shows where they live uh, in proximity. And Mrs. Murdoch, who lives just to the west of you, uh, that is the one neighbor who was pretty insistent that it, it be an estate type fence, which is what you plan to do anyway. Yes, I okay. think on the form, her name shows up as Harrison because that was her former last name, but it, it's, it's Mrs. Murdoch. Okay, and uh, uh, each of these uh, letters was provided to you? Yes, Mrs. Morris, Mrs. Wilson, uh, Mrs. Murdoch, and I think the Wong Lees also wrote okay. a letter of support for me. Okay. And there is one neighbor that abuts immediately to the south uh, whose uh, uh, name is not indicated in between the Morrises and uh, uh, Morris and Murdoch, just south of you. And what neighbor is that? Oh, I think that's Mark and Jessica. Right. Uh, and Say the name again, uh, on the, uh, Say the name so I can have it for the record. Uh, Mark and Jessica. I think their last name is Davis. Is that da correct? Davis. Davis. Uh, Mark and Jill Ann Davis, uh, um, as indicated on the Exhibit A1, uh, uh, the survey. Is that correct? Uh, Jill, unfortunately, passed away, so it's Jessica. No, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. No, it's OK. okay. Good. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and uh, did you have a conversation with that neighbor? I did, I did, and, and can you tell us? What yes, that was? so um, Jessica, um, we had lunch all together, all the neighbors together. Mrs. Wilson was there, and then two other neighbors were there. And Jessica um, has said she's fine with the eight-foot fence going up, but she has requested that I not touch the invisible fence that she had installed for her own dog. It's one of those electric fences, and I reassured her that any fence that I might be given approval. Um, would be going exactly where it is. I wouldn't be moving it, so there would be no interference. I don't have any other questions. Uh, Do members of the board have questions for this witness? 
Um, Sarah, just, just so I'm clear, so mm -hmm. three events in the past year? Three that I have seen, yes. Three that you have seen, okay, yes. thanks. Anybody else? And you're prepared to bury at least by another 10 inch, 10 to 12 inches? I'm sorry? You're prepared to have basically a nine foot fence with yes. eight, eight of it above ground and one yes. below ground? Yes. And, and I think the, uh, make the information we have provided to the board indicates that that's necessary for the fence to be effective, otherwise you're at risk of having the coyotes uh, uh, come in underneath. So uh, that certainly is something that uh, is agreeable and would be uh, a condition uh, that we... Can you just doing the back thing? Yes, just the back. So, so what about the side? Are coyotes can't come in on the side? No, they can. They can, but I don't allow my dog to go out the side and the front because it's not fully enclosed so there's less of a risk there and when my cousins and you know little, little children come to play it's normally in the back area where the pool is so I, I was concerned more about the back area okay. um, so on, on the drawing yes. it's only that very bottom line it's not the entire it, it's, it's just, the entire. just to be clear currently there is a fence that is everywhere where this fence is, and it connects to the corners of the house. Okay. So that is a totally enclosed yard. Uh, the front yard is open, and uh, uh, animals of all types can roam yeah. through that yard. <laughs> uh, so it is to provide a protected area at the rear of the property where living is not out the back. It says deck, but it's really a slate patio out there. Oh, well, my question is, the line you have drawn, that's going to be the new eight-foot fence, and that would the be entire the thing. Foot, that would yes. be the new eight-foot fence, Got it. and it would not extend anywhere else on the property other than in that area. That's the right. line Thank is you. where I currently have my six-foot fence and where I'm hoping the eight-foot fence would go in. Thank you. Uh, so you, uh, you did include an article uh, by Jeff Gortzen. Uh, where they you've highlighted it's great coyotes, coyotes can easily leap an eight-foot fence or wall so my question to you is um, this is probably your one shot you're not going to come back you're not going to be able to come back a month or two months from now and say I saw another coyote right. jumped across an eight-foot eight right. fence right. I still have the problem can I get a 10-foot fence right. can I get a 12-foot fence right. so I mean, I'm, I, I guess I'm asking you just to say, be sure this is what you want because you're probably only going to get one shot and it may not fix your problem. <clears throat> that's, that's the scary part about this. And, and let me say this, Mr. DeWissey, that, uh, that, that, that is a legitimate comment. I have also independently looked at a lot of literature and whatnot that we haven't presented to the board. Um, and uh, the, the dominant recommendation is uh, eight feet. Uh, I'm sure that at some point you may get the coyote with the strong legs that uh, given the right conditions and uh, hunger and everything else could possibly do something more. But uh, the feeling is that that is a reasonable uh, amount of protection. And, and, and I think that uh, even the, uh, I think most literature bears that out. And, that, and that's fine. I, I would just be cautious. I mean, because again, I, I'm in favor of it because I think this at least is Thank something you. a minimum of relief necessary to, to cure a hardship. I'd make sure you get a fence where you could put a roller on it. Because yeah. if, if you don't, you're in trouble because that is your next step. Right. So, and, and that, 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 I was going to follow yeah. that. Yeah. So I just I would say if, if, you're, if you're not positive that your, your iron or plastic fence that you're thinking about can actually take a roller. I wouldn't put that in the record. I would just say it's one an eight foot fence that I can and right. be and, whatever it is. And I think Sarah has actually investigated that and determined that she can put the roller Good. one from this type of fencing should that be required. Good. Any uh, more questions for this witness? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I've been paying attention, but I'm a little confused because okay. I thought I heard you say that there is some portion of your current fence that you are not replacing. No, just the front. I will not be anything that's on the sides that I have. I will not be replacing. So, uh, as has been asked before, everything that is in orange will be replaced. Will if, be if, replaced. Yes, so, yes. from corner of the house, yes, all the way around to corner yes. of the house will yes. be replaced. I have side fences that come out and curve out towards the front of the house, but I'm not look seeking to yeah, replace there, those. There is a fence you'll see on the plan in this area, which is a wood fence now, six feet. 
since that's not enclosing anything, we're not looking for relief there. So everything we're looking for is sort of behind the house. It, one of the reasons that might have been a little confusing is in this area, just to the west, and in this area, just to the east, there's estate fencing there. So that's, those are the sections of estate fencing. The rest of the fence along the uh, side and the rear property line is a wooden fence. Right. But that, even, even that estate fence is only six feet currently, so that would be replaced with, with the state fence. Other questions? No other questions? How does the, uh, I'm sorry, if you go with the estate fence, what, what's the separation of those bars? And couldn't they go right through the fence? Uh, good point. We didn't put specific testimony on there, but I think the recommendation is that they be no more than four inches uh, in order to provide that protection so uh, they would be uh, of a, uh, a proximity to one another that would uh, uh, make it uh, not possible for the coyote to get through. And is, is uh, it referring to A31, the, the spacing between the vertical members, is that four inches now? It is right now. Thank you. Yes. I'm not, I'm not in a hurry this time because I've asked five times. <laughs> Are there any other questions of this witness? Okay, seeing none, do you have any other witnesses? I, no other witnesses. Uh, if I you you did the, indicate you wanted to uh, present I'll, argument. I'll try to do this very quickly, maybe 60 seconds if you'll give me that. Uh, this is uh, a dimensional variance. It's not your classic uh, hardship case. I understand that. Uh, uh, I could try to make it a hardship case, and I think there are some elements here, but it. it uh, it really, I think, falls more clearly under a de minimis uh, variance case in that it is dimensional. You've got uh, the Hertzberg law out there. Uh, the property is located in an area where coyotes have uh, uh, actually entered this property on a couple of occasions. They're in the area uh, so that that concern is legitimate. Uh, the fence that is proposed is of a type, a color, a, a style that will minimize its impact. I think if you had a six foot stockade fence along the rear property line, it's gonna have a lot more impact than a, an estate type fencing that has as its backdrop all the mature vegetation uh, that exists in, in this rear yard. The fence is just in the rear yard. It's not, we're not looking to extend it towards the street uh, or towards the front of the property since it's uh, not on the street, but rather on a driveway that serves other properties. And, uh, Finally, uh, the uh, Township of Middletown uh, versus Zoning Hearing Board uh, of Middletown Township, I think is a case that would support that when you look uh, and evaluate a de minimis variance, it's necessary to consider whether rigid compliance is necessary to preserve the public interest. And I think that uh, we've demonstrated that this won't have any adverse impact on the public interest of the type of interest where you don't want fences in people's faces. This isn't going to be that type of fence. So I'll hand that in to Mr. Ryan, and I thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wanted to be heard as to this matter? Okay, seeing none, uh, to prompt our uh, discussion, I'd uh, welcome a motion. Motion to approve a variance, uh, section 280.109 of the code, to replace six inch, six foot fence with an eight foot fence per the markings on A1. Is there a second to that motion? Okay, that. <laughs> okay. Now, now for discussion, and first a question for, for the solicitor. Is it within our purview to um, restrict the relief in the, given the issue of the type of fence? Or, or yes, it is. Okay. Um, would you be open to an amendment to your motion that it would be an estate fence? I am thinking I want to give her as much flexibility as she can okay. to make sure that no coyote is going to get in there. And if she puts an estate fence in and the coyote goes through the, the thing, I wouldn't want her to have to come back to try to get a wood fence and just okay. say, well, it's the same height, it's just a different look. Well, so, so right now, so right, hold Go on. So, so right now the motion is for approval period without that limitation. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to the, I mean, the, the, 
the good thing here is given the absence of an objecting party, we don't need an opinion to create too much of a record. I, I am, I am um, cognizant of not creating too broad of a precedent. And I think that what you have here is a circumstance where there's evidence that the coyote had previously entered the property. It's heavily wooded with mature vegetation. There's a significant distance from neighboring properties and there's support of neighboring properties. And apparently one of the neighboring property owners who provided the support provided it based upon the assumption that it would be an estate fence. So I think I understand your point, but I think a countervailing consideration here is we're, I think it's in our interest to say this is a pretty narrow circumstance and one of the narrow circumstances is everybody's on board and the reason at least one person's on board is it's in the state fence. So I would argue that we should amend the motion to add that, but before I suggest that as a formal amendment, I'll see what other people think. I'm with Brad. I don't think that motion's addition is necessary. You know, if we're going to give this relief, put up whatever fence they want. I, I, I would agree with the chairman that at least one of the neighbors has indicated that their approval of, of this application is contingent on the type of fence that it is. You know, query whether that neighbor would be with us this evening if they knew that the fence would not be the estate fence. Obviously, they're not here. Obviously, they have provided a letter, which I thought pretty clearly indicated that their approval was conditional. And I'm, uh, uh, with the chairman, I am, I am uh, reluctant to grant the application without the limitation of the type of fence. I didn't think it was an issue. It sounded like you wanted to put this fence. I don't like the wooden fences. So <laughs> it, it sounds like if you were willing to say, yes, that's what I'm going to do. And, that's what and, I'm going to do anyway. And it became <laughs> conditional then, because I kind of agree with you. So I, I could see where it's not, kind of a moot point, because mm -hmm. that's what you want to do. Are you yes. willing to go on record to say, that, that's what I'm going to be putting in? I will in. be putting up either an iron or an yeah. aluminum fence. That no, notwithstanding, they're going on. Okay, so, okay, so, so, so amended. Okay, so the, the um, motion as offered has been amended to provide that the eight foot fence will be an estate fence consistent with the uh, evidence. Consistent with the evidence, yeah. The, yeah, the photograph. Cons consistent with A31. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a motion that's been seconded. Any more discussion? Yeah, I, I have a couple questions on this, and, and the presidential value of this. Um, I think we have, to, if we're going to give this relief, we have to have a pretty detailed opinion, I think. Um, because why wouldn't every single resident of this township be allowed to put up eight-foot fences? Coyotes can show up anywhere. I mean, it's horrific that they showed up three times for one property. And maybe this particular property, there's something about it. <laughs> it's a hardship. It attracts these things. I don't know. Probably not. But my point is, um, I mean, I live in North Wayne, and who knows? A coyote can come up there. I better put up an eight-foot fence now. And, and every resident of the township would have the same argument. So that concerns me. I'd uh, welcome some input from the solicitor in terms of... Uh that question whether we're better off with a uh, more detailed opinion which distinguishes this given the characteristics I mentioned previously. What are your thoughts, John? Uh, my thoughts are to keep it sh short. I would uh, definitely mention the wooded, uh, uh, heavily wooded nature of the property and the fact that uh, uh, that, that, that this has happened three times, but I'd still do it as a one paragraph uh, uh, order as I normally do uh, for uncontested approvals. Uh, again, uh, it is legally not a binding precedent. Uh, just because you give a variance to Ms. Chang doesn't mean you have to give it to Mr. Smith. 
Uh, and I think we have uh, here a situation of somebody who has been touched by tragedy, who's shown that her uh, property is uh, uh, whatever it takes to be a target for coyotes, her, t her property is it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, I would uh, uh, opt for a shorter thing, uh, you know, but, but I'd put that in. I don't think that this, the variance is de minimis, though. And, and honestly, my hope is, because I, I, I had the same concern, uh, that if coyotes become a problem in the township, that township will, will have to step up and start doing something, because otherwise, if it becomes a safety issue, I don't know why the township would, would be saying, no, six foot is it, when safety says eight. So I, I, I'm the current, but I, I was also saying it's, this is always, we don't have to follow precedent, it's fact rated. All right, we, we have a motion. Uh, any more discussion? Scott? It, it sounded like you had the option with a trap, and although it's a little expensive, it, it may be a prelude to consider the, the trap, get the, the animal caged. Is there, any, is there any thought that you would go that process if, with the if trap? I, if I can try to address that based on Ms. Chang's testimony, and that is uh, she was told it could be trapped, but then it would be released into the wild again. And then the concern is uh, whether it finds its way back. I, I think the other safe assumption is that it's, there's not just one coyote out there, that there are others, uh, that, uh, and which means that in the future there will be others. So, and, and uh, the, the article that we cited, they, they have been cited elsewhere as well, so I don't think it's one coyote roaming the uh, the western suburbs, I think there are probably more out there, but we haven't provided you any testimony yet. I'm going to call for a vote. We have a motion that's been seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 None opposed. It approves fire. Nothing. Opposed. I'm sorry? Opposed. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't, okay. didn't hear. Uh, the the uh, relief is granted by a vote of four to one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, the record should show that uh, Mr. Homick has returned and will be sitting on the next matter. Um, it's up there. Uh, appeal number 3016. The applicant, EDA Family Limited Partnership, property located at 517 East Lancaster Avenue and zoned R5 residential seeks a special exception under section 280-101A1, which provides that any change in non-residential occupancy shall be deemed a change of use for the purposes of this section. Yeah. Thank you. Um, as the chairperson uh, mentioned, uh, this is in regards to that last sentence of uh, section 101A that was amended in 1997 uh, regarding any change in non-residential occupancy shall be determined a change of use for purposes of this, which require a special exception. Uh, you may recall that a couple years ago, we had an applicant come forward, same property, um, and uh, they ended up not executing the lease. And this is another applicant, it's uh, Mr. Roboski, who actually lives on Spring Mill Road or on Sprawl Road, which was an interesting discussion that we're having here. And uh, he is going to be operating it for his wealth management business. It's still an office use. Um, it's still a non-conforming use. It's consistent with the other office use that was in here before. You may recall previously it was Planned Parenthood, which was an office use. Um, and then the proposal for the, uh, it was a doctor's office of some sort, and uh, now this proposal. Um, so we'd be asking a special exception under 101A. It remains the same building. There's really been no change to it. It's still an office type building. There will be some interior renovations, no exterior renovations, and really no change in appearance to the exterior of the building, except I understand there may be an awning you may put up. Is what I think Frank has said. Um, I need to swear her in. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
you do solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes. And state your full name, please. Stacy Ballard. And Stacy, I'll just go through the testimony. That's fine. Um, uh, how are you employed? I work for EDA Enterprises as the president of their commercial division. And how long you've been employed? I've been with them um, for 30 years. And uh, I'm going to call your attention to the subject property. And uh, first, we have a deed, and um, Ida purchased the property. I'm going to show you a copy of the deed. It's been marked as Exhibit A, and Ida purchased the property in 2004. Is that correct? That's correct. And have you made any changes to the property since you purchased it in 2004? A new roof. We've upgraded carpet and, and paint in hallways and, and done some interior renovations with apartments, and, but that's it. Really, it, it looks very similar to how it, how it was originally constructed. And what exists on the site? So on the site is essentially a U-shaped uh, three-story Georgian colonial brick uh, apartment building with 56 apartments. And there is on the west end a small one-story building that has 10 garages. And then there is a single-story building that we're talking about that was Planned Parenthood. I'm going to show you just as for A3, you actually are president of the company, but you, we did have a, a power of attorney signed by... Um, by Chantal. Okay. Yes. A, a, agreeing to have you represent yes. here and, and uh, agree to any conditions that may be imposed. And also, A4, I've uh, included copies of the zoning code of Ranner, which permitted actually an R5, which is R5 zoning district back in 1972 and previously uh, up until 1987, office type use in the R5 zoning district. Um, I'm also going to show you what's been marked as A5, and you describe the uses in the property. And perhaps if we look at A5, you can just quickly go through again where this building is located on A5. So the south side of the building is... It fronts on Lancaster Avenue, is, correct? It's on Lancaster Avenue. And the large U-shaped building is the three-story apartment building. The structure in the back right corner of this print is a, a two-story kind of split-level home that probably was the original home uh, when this uh, Sonny Sheldrake had built this complex. To the left of the large apartment building is the one-story office building that we're talking about that was Planned Parenthood that now we're looking and putting in this wealth management office. And to the left of that is the one-story uh, garage, 10 garages. Um, and how many parking spaces do you have on the site? I believe there's 104 spaces on the site. And has there ever been any issue regarding parking on the site? There, there's not. It, it's assigned to each apartment. There's guest parking that's there, and there is also parking that's designated for the um, office building. Now, in, Mr. In, Cornelia, uh, this plan that you put in is, uh, is A5, but you also have uh, another A5. Yes. Um, I, if we can, I'll, this is a smaller version of A5 because we have to send a PDF now. So this okay, is the ver so this is, is the same, kind of the smaller the version. Yes, yeah, the same okay. thing. Um, Kevin asked for the larger plan, so um, I did submit larger plans that all of you should have in the file, hopefully. Uh, I believe we were talking about the site itself, and can can you describe what is surrounding the site? What type of uses? So uh, to the east side is Cambria Court. And this is uh, residential single family homes. To the north side. Beyond is, that, as you go further east, what is there? Uh, there's the, um, the Radnor Corporate Center. Uh, there's the, the restaurants that are there and the Philadelphia sports gym thing. Uh, and then the, the shopping center that has the uh, Genardi's and uh, some other, some other uh, retail stores as well as some restaurants. That's across the street. That's across the street, but that's, that's okay. just a, liter, immediately east. And then going west, of course, is the um, Aberwick or Wessex House, Wessex House, I believe. And, uh, and, and there are apartments. And those are apartment buildings just like the Sheldrake apartments are. And then north are single family homes and then the train tracks. And then south is uh, condominiums. Um, 
I'm going to just show you some photographs that we've marked as exhibits. And if you can tell the board first, I'm going to show you what's been marked as A6. Can you tell the board what A6 represents? So A6 is a image that is uh, looking from Lancaster Avenue to the single story building that was Planned Parenthood. Uh, A7 is stepping a little farther uh, west and looking a eastbound. So now you see the Planned Parenthood building, which is the single story, and then the three story building that is the uh, apartments. Um, A8 is the front entrance to the apartment building. A9 is looking west towards the garages that are the single story garages on the far west. Uh, A10 are some cars parked in front of the entrance to what was the Planned Parenthood building. The entrance isn't facing Lancaster Avenue. It's actually on the side of the building. I'm sorry. Do you know when that photograph was taken? Uh, the, I, was that from before? It was, was the building it, occupied? No. Okay. Yeah, I believe it was. These actual photographs were taken from, I believe, the 2016 hearing. So they were probably taken right over, actually they were taken by me. So um, they were right probably prior to the hearing. Yeah, the point, the point of the question was whether that, uh, whether the office space was occupied at the time the photograph was taken. I don't believe it was. Um, so, uh, you know, oftentimes people spread a little bit when, when they uh, don't have occupancy. And also a couple of those cars could be some of our guys that would be pulling in and working in them. And then one, one question regarding the uh, office occupancy. Does that, is that, um, does that conflict with the apartment use? No, it actually works out perfect because most of the um, census that we have in the apartments works during the day. So there's a lot of empty and free spaces during the day when the offices are available. The one conflict that we did have with Planned Parenthood was because they were open sometimes till 9 o'clock at night. And, uh, and this will be a little different. Do you know how many, um, did Planned Parenthood have a lot of guests coming into the site? Yeah, I mean, it was like a regular primary care physician's doctor's office. They had uh, five or six um, patient rooms, so you could have had five or six patients uh, seeing doctors at the time. They had two uh, counseling rooms where they would talk to gals about birth control and other stuff. And then they had, you know, a large waiting area as well. So, you know, you could potentially have had um, you know, six staff members or seven staff members, and then another 12 or maybe even 15 guests and clients coming in. I'm showing you what's been marked. I believe, did we get to A11? Did you describe A11 yet? Nope. Uh, so A11 is, um, I don't know, is that looking at the- uh, I think it's looking, um, I think it's looking west, west towards, the, uh, towards the Wessex House. And then A12 is looking east onto the first office building at Cambria Court. And A13 is looking uh, south at the condos, the St. David's condos. And A14 is uh, just the opinion from the prior hearing back yes. in 2016? Correct. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, proposed use and what Frank's intending to use the property for? Yes. Um, is that use less intensive than the former Planned Parenthood use? Definitely. Um, and is it consistent with what you want for the site as far as traffic and patients and things of that nature? Yes. Uh, that's all I have for Stacy. I have Frank. Uh, uh, approximately when did the Planned Parenthood use stop? Somewhere between 2015 and 2016, okay. they actually um, stopped uh, occupying that site. Um, they, they lost some funding, but that actually came later. They uh, were treating and, and had their, their largest clientele were the college students. And at that point, the colleges offered the same services in their own health clinics. So the need wasn't there. And, okay, uh, okay. Have, have you made any changes to this building since Planned Parenthood left? Us. We, we haven't. Um, the only thing we've done so far is we had a demolition permit to get rid of interior partitions. 
Um, we are currently working with the township with a sprinkler permit and to get two handicap restrooms in. And then we've submitted a permit for some interior fit out, which I think um, gives us like six offices and a conference room. Did you ever have any intent to abandon the office use at this site? No. Um, is it feasible to use this building for residential purposes? Uh, I, I guess you could. Um, it would be a significant investment to try to turn those into apartments, but it, it has always been an, it has always been an office, so we've kept it an office. And actually, you're not conforming as to the number of apartment apartments already in this site. Is that it? well? She's already not. Okay. We're already non-conforming. <laughs> Just a follow up on your question. So. Yes. <laughs> Um, do any members of the board have questions of this witness? Seeing none, you want to present your next witness? Right. Sure. Thank you. Sir, if you raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. And state name and spell it so I can hear, please. Sure. Frank Grabuski, G R A B U S K I. Okay. And Frank, where do you live? My wife and I are 121 Burnside Road in Villanova. Uh, what's your profession? Wealth advisor, financial advisor. How long have you been in that field? Uh, on the institutional side since 2005, on the retail side, which I previously was working up in New York and Connecticut, moved home, grew up in South Devon, uh, went to Radnor High School, opened up my own retail practice in 2011. And um, where do you currently conduct your practice? 148 East Lancaster Avenue, which is the red brick building right next to the Gap in uh, downtown Wayne. And uh, why have you, or why are you leaving that site? Uh, my practice has gone to the next level. I'm ready to go out on my own. We currently have seven in-house advisors with an LLC called Wharton Advisor Group, which we're actually dissolving middle of this year. Um, so we're looking for office space and uh, moving out on my own. Okay, at least initially, how many staff do you anticipate having? One this year, and then over the next few years, hire a couple more support staff. Okay, and how, as far as currently, the, you do not have any other wealth advisors coming in to the site? No, but the plan will be over the next two to three years, hire a few more, three to four. Uh, we have a max capacity of seven offices, so it would be myself and then no, other, no more other than five other advisors. How frequently do you see clients at the site? Almost as far as frequency, as far as a client itself, how frequently would, would one client come to the site? Just about every day, I'd say. I mean, no, clients, no, but okay, yeah, I think you're missing. How many meetings per day is the question? No, no. Okay. How many, when you have a client, a particular client A comes in to see you, how frequently do they come in uh, a year? Typically quarterly reviews, but more frequently semi annual reviews in person. My clients come in to do uh, portfolio reviews. All right, so it's not like they, it's not like a doctor's office where they're in no. and out all the time. Two to four times a year office visits. All right. Uh, have you entered into a lease with Ida for the property? We have okay. for a five year lease. And are you making any exterior uh, modifications to the building? Just the small awning that you guys previously discussed outside. A little pen roof over the front so you don't have <clears throat> um, That's all I have. In, in the course of a, a, a normal work day, how many different clients might come in to visit with you? Three to five. Okay. And um, what parts of the day would you most commonly see clients at your office? Typically afternoon, mid-afternoon. Uh, half my clients are retired, half are working. For the clients who are working, they come in at lunch or maybe four, five, six o'clock, right after they end their work day. Would you describe it as common or unusual? Would you describe it as common or unusual or rare to see clients at your office on weekends? Rare. Okay. Do uh, other members of the board have questions for this witness? Seeing none, you want to move your exhibits? Uh, just move the exhibits to make part of the record, please. Anything else? Uh, that's all I would have. Okay. Um, anyone would like to make a motion, and then we can discuss it. Mr. Chairman, I move that the uh, applicant be granted the special exception relief that it is requesting uh, in the application. 
Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Okay. Um, just cover our bases. Is there any discussion? Seems like a reasonable use and an appropriate intensity of use for that location. Doesn't seem to be burdening the location. We have no objectors. That being said, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> Hearing none, uh, relief is granted 5 0. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, that's the end of this meeting. <laughs> <laughs>